Alex Ross has been called the Norman Rockwell of comics. His realistic, detailed renderings of iconic heroes made a huge impact on comic art when Marvels was released in the 90s, and he's continued to impress readers ever since. His watercolor paintings are famous for how they make superheroes seem more real than they ever have, creating figures and scenes that even modern movies can't match. Ross began to think about the impact of seeing comic heroes in a realistic style as a kid, seeing Spider-Man on TV. He recalls, Just the vividness. Seeing a guy in a costume was especially powerful. I liken that to the fact that I became a realist in my adult life because I was always used to seeing characters in more than two dimensions. More than having an incline surrounding a body, but in fact being as graphically realized as was possible. Now, a lot of artists just draw. We're not always reflective about the choices we make and why. But Ross has spent a lot of time analyzing his approach, saying, There's only so much recall the human mind seems to have, or at least mine, that's for sure. Most comic artist styles, whether they're more exaggerated like Bruce Timm, or more representational like, say, Neil Adams, more realistic, all these things are based upon what things we fill our heads with. And there's only so much, generally, that each artist has accumulated. The more realistic artists are the guys who've obviously studied and fill their heads that much more with exact figure shape and realism of lighting and outline, whereas your average comic artist is more based upon drawing from the mind's eye and just imagination of how to render objects and people. So the more exaggerated styles, or just simple basic styles, everything from John Byrne to George Perez, that's not so much based upon reality as it is a certain form of cartooning. It's a reduction of reality to a basic stylization of how they understood the world to be. In my feeling, it's almost like you've taken everything that your eyes can see, or that your eyes can collect, and then you've almost put a finger on stopping at a certain point, saying, okay, this is where I stop, and from this point, I'm just going to create my own version of how I want things to be. Well, I'm more of a filter. Most of your average comic artists are not going and studying life. They're basically just running forward with what their style has become, based upon the process of doing. Neither approach is bad. I guess the fundamentals of fine artists and illustrators over the years has been to always continue to look at the base, which is reality. Ross's thoughtful approach, I'd argue, is one of the things that sets his work apart, even from other artists that match his realism. And that's what I wanted to highlight in this video. As much as I admire the near flawless compositions and techniques in Ross's work, I've always been just as impressed, if not more so, with how he chooses to portray our favorite characters, what he emphasizes and focuses on. And I think that's a result of the thought he's put into these characters. I'm going to focus on my two favorite characters, Superman and Batman, and how his portrayal of the world's finest heroes have impacted comics. Superman, the world's first and best superhero, is probably Ross's most successful adaptation. His goal was to bring a lot of the classic elements of the character back, to revisit the hero portrayed by Joe Shuster and the Fleischer Brothers. And he was largely successful. The popularity of his Superman, starting with his work on the character in Kingdom Come, almost immediately was seen influencing the monthly artists working on the books at the time. Starting in the mid-80s, John Byrne redesigned the characters, distilling parts of earlier Superman portrayals into a look that defined the character for more than a decade. When Ross's version was seen in the smash hit Kingdom Come, the more trim, youthful Triangle Era Superman, drawn by Byrne and Dan Jurgens, took on some of the more stockier, more Schuster-like face and proportions. Ed McGuinness, who had a great run on the Superman books, is a great example of this. While his stylized, almost cartoony work is unlike Ross's hyper-real illustrations, McGuinness was drawing upon the wider jaw, squintier face, and larger build that Ross brought back. An interviewer commented to Ross, Your Superman seems to be a perfect blending of the live-action Superman that have come before. Ross responded, Well, that's nice to hear, and it's certainly what I'm going for. Not so much a conscious blend, as I wanted to uphold the spirit of the Schuster original. That was purely my goal in it. Ross got some help in this endeavor from his Superman model, fellow artist Frank Casey, who posed for reference photos. Ross describes what having Casey modeling the character brought to his process. He's not certainly the grandeur of Superman. He's not that tall, he doesn't have that hair, he doesn't really even have the eyebrows. But there's something to the man. Frank has always had a very strong presence to him. There's a look in the face that's there in the skin that really lends something to the character. Ross's Superman has defined the character visually for decades now, and you can still see his influence in current DC Comics artwork. He reflected, I've always felt a strong connection to Superman in particular. He can be used as an American icon, and can be used to basically contribute various ideas and even ideologies, much like Uncle Sam. 
Just making standalone imagery of him is inspirational. That's enough for me to get charged up. I have a lifelong connection to these characters, and I want to reflect that influence back. There is always so much more to give. Ross's Batman is also a favorite of mine, but in a lot of ways, it wasn't as influential as his Superman. I think there are a few reasons for this. Batman is a grounded character compared to other superpowered heroes in otherworldly realms. Because of this, even realistic versions of the Dark Knight, like Neil Adams or Brian Bolland's portrayals, employ a lot of stylistic flourishes that don't really lend themselves to a photographic style. The cape sometimes is animated in possible ways that make it almost a character of its own. That kind of thing looks great, but when you take it past an ink drawing, it can become distracting. You can find yourself wondering how an element does something like that the more it's literalized, and that can get confusing. Kelly Jones's super large bat ears look great in his style, but on a realistically portrayed figure might look less than imposing. Ultimately, the way these two characters work, how they function narratively, lend themselves to different styles. Batman is so grounded, it's what makes him great. A lot of the best artistic portrayals of him lean towards rendering styles and effects that suggest an unrealism that the character himself shouldn't have. They give him and Gotham a grandeur that contrasts with the fact that he doesn't have any supernatural abilities to lean on. The reverse is true of Superman. A cartoon character flying around just seems normal. A realistically rendered person in a world that looks like our world highlights just how amazing the things Superman can do truly are. It gives his world weight and gravitas. Ross describes his Batman. It's difficult working on Batman because so much has already been done with him. The challenge is to bring something new to the character that doesn't feel forced or illogical. And the movies have gone so over the top with effects, gadgets, glitz, etc. So I went low-tech with them, and took steps they wouldn't. The fact that in the films he has all his riches so conspicuously displayed, to me, runs counter to hiding his identity. My approach is to not show any of the trappings, as was the case with the very first version of him in 1939. No Batmobile, no Batplane. I love all that stuff, but it takes the focus away from the character himself, which is what interests me. It should all be a mystery. Nobody even knows if he has a plane, because no one's ever seen it. He has a rope, an unmarked car, a few crude weapons. He just appears, which is even scarier. Another modification was to enlarge the bat symbol on his chest. That's inspired by Joe Staten's depiction of Batman from the 1970s. I think it totally suits him. Why wouldn't it be big? It's imposing. He's Batman, for heaven's sake. If you're a fan of comic art like I am, be sure to like this video and subscribe. I'll have a lot more deep dives into the legendary artist whose work inspires us, and that's the best way to make sure you see it. Also, you can click on the link tree in the description right below to take a look at the comics this art inspired me to make. We Are Scarlet Twilight is a pulp-influenced thriller inspired by Batman and other heroes of the 30s and 40s. It's a combination of the Art Deco atmosphere of Golden Age comics with all the best stuff we expect to see in comics today. And my other book, August, is an 80s-inspired sci-fi space opera with some spaghetti western thrown in. If you're a fan of Star Wars, Transformers, He-Man, any of that stuff, this is the book for you. I tried to make it feel like something awesome from the late 80s that you get to go back and read for the first time. You can check out both of these at the link below. Single issues, collections, or live campaigns. And let's get back to the video. I think, though, that some of the more fantastical visual elements have become so much a part of Batman's iconic look that they're really missed when they're gone. Ross's Batman looks great with the eyes exposed, but it removes the white lenses that most artists use for Batman's mask. And there's something about the central conceit of the character, that he dressed like that to scare people into thinking he might be a supernatural creature striking from the shadows, that's at odds with seeing him rendered so literally. Years later, Ross got a chance to do a series of Batman covers, but found that it would be a series where Dick Grayson takes over the mantle. He took this opportunity to adjust his approach, the book Rough Justice, a collection of Ross's sketches and drawings, recounts. Along with the invitation to do monthly covers for the Superman comic, came the opportunity to do Batman as well. As with the Superman book, I drew several tight potential cover roughs for consideration. Very quickly I learned they intended to kill Bruce Wayne, Batman, and fully pass the mantle on to Dick Grayson. Instead of rejecting this direction, I embraced the design potential to try and channel a different one of my influences in Batman history. Given the arguably less bulky body type of Dick Grayson, I imagine that his overall look could radically change, or revert, to a leaner, more sinewy form in the style of legendary Batman artist Neil Adams. Instead of doing the black and dark gray costumed, thicker Bob Kane, Dick Sprang inspired style I had always done, here I could try out the bright blue and yellow look that dominated for so many years. Showing some integration of the contemporary Nightwing costume, 
I wanted to try the gray bodysuit as all black, with a return to the yellow oval symbol in the canister belt and a metallic sheen on the blue areas, indicating a potential bulletproof quality. I was very enthusiastic about depicting the character in a manner that revisited an older look in an interesting way. This resulted in some really great visuals, and the adjustment to something slightly closer to the classic look of the character makes you realize what goes into mixing up features of the traditional Batman portrayal. Overall, I don't think Ross's version of Batman was as widely adopted by later artists as his Superman for those reasons. That said, I really enjoy the uniqueness of his Batman. It lives in some space between the cinematic versions and the comics. And I find myself revisiting Justice, which was drawn by Doug Braithwaite in Ross's style and then painted by Ross, in the classic War on Crime several times a year. Alex Ross summed up his approach, the one that gave us these great interpretations of these characters and others, with this. An artist is always influenced by the first things they ever see. Superheroes, for me, are a great inspiration for life. What I try to do in drafting any iconic character is a distillation into an idealized version. My, my goal has never been realism or to present figures realistically. My goal is to draft things as dynamic and archetypally as possible. I try to communicate the same feeling I had when I was a kid, when I first discovered my favorite characters. I hope you've liked this look at Alex Ross's art. Let me know your favorite Ross books in the comments, and let me know who you'd like to see me take a look at next. Oh, and one other thing. There's a Kickstarter live now that recounts the creation and impact of Kingdom Come in a documentary. Head over to Kickstarter at the link below to check it out.